Hello, ninth graders. Are you looking for a quick and easy way to revise all your chapters from Beehive? Well, look no further. Listen to this video, and you will be prepared for your exams. Today, we are going over chapter one from Beehive, which is the fun they had. So, let's get to it. The Fun They Had is a story by Isaac Asimov. The story is set in the future year 2157, when books are digital and schools are conducted digitally through virtual classrooms. These classes are taken by a mechanical teacher, a robot, instead of a human class teacher. The story starts with two children named Margie and Tommy who find a real book. They live in a world where computers dominate each and every sphere of life and how they attend virtual classes. With the onset of virtual schools, the concept of books and classrooms has transformed considerably from the olden days. On 17th May 2157, Margie wrote in her diary about how Tommy found a real book. It was an old book that consisted of stories. Margie's grandfather once told her that when he was a young boy, his grandfather informed him that all the stories used to be printed on paper in those days. Both Margie and Tommy started turning the yellow and crumpled pages of the book to discover more about those days. They found it hilarious to read the book as the words stood fixed in one place instead of moving the way they saw on a computer screen. Tommy exclaims that it is an utter waste to read the hard copy of a book and throw it away once completed. He feels that their television screen has a million books on it and could store plenty more without throwing it away. So, soon... They start reading about a school during the ancient times when the teachers were human rather than mechanical teachers. Although Margie hated the concept of schools, she's surprised to know actual persons taught at school. This is because she has only seen robots teaching her at school. Moreover, she is not so fond of her school that is next to her bedroom as she does not have any classmates and the mechanical teacher always gives her loads of homework to do. Both Margie and Tommy study in a virtual classroom that includes electronic gadgets, robots, etc. Their daily lesson appears on a computer screen which teaches them different subjects like maths, science, etc. Once, Margie's mother called the county inspector to fix the mechanical device on which Margie attends her virtual classes. He put the big black screen together again on which all the lessons are displayed and the questions are asked. However, the little girl was disappointed about the device getting fixed so soon. She knew she would soon need to put homework and test papers into it through a punch code. Further, as both the children continue reading the book, Margie's mother calls her to attend her classes. While Margie attends her school, the mechanical teacher teaches about fractions. But Margie's mind starts wondering about the fun her grandparents had while visiting a school in those days. Those days, a school used to be a special building and all the kids of the same age studied together. She imagines how the kids from different areas in the neighborhood would come together and attend school merrily. Thus, Margie gets fascinated about the fun the children had centuries ago when they went to a real school having a physical existence. Today, we are going over chapter 3 from Beehive, which is The Little Girl. So let's get to it. The Little Girl was written by Catherine Mansfield. This story is about a little girl named Kezia who lived with her parents and grandmother. She was always afraid of her father and avoided him as much as she could. She took a great sigh of relief whenever he left for work. She trembled with fear whenever she confronted him. She would mumble in terror whenever she was near him. According to her, her father was a rude and harsh person and she would try not to confront him whenever he was at home. 
Kezia's grandmother would always tell her to understand her parents in a better way. She would often encourage the little girl to chat with her parents in the drawing room. But the young girl always received cold treatment from her parents. One day, her grandmother advised Kezia that she should make a pincushion as a gift for her father's birthday that was coming the following week. Kezia stitched three sides of the cushion laboriously and kept one side open to stuff the case with something. She wondered what she could stuff it with and wandered into her mother's bedroom to search for some scraps. There she found numerous sheets of fine paper, accumulated them, tore them into small pieces and stuffed the pincushion case. Then finally sewed the fourth side. Those papers were actually her father's great speech for the port authority. When Kezia's mother came to know that the little girl had torn those sheets of paper, she called her daughter to the drawing room immediately. Her father was angry with her and he didn't listen to the reason why she tore the sheets of paper. He simply punished her with a ruler on her pink little palms. Kezia sobbed miserably but failed to understand why she was punished for speaking the truth and accepting the blunder that she had committed. She felt miserable and silently wept and questioned the purpose of God in creating fathers. Later in the evening, she saw her neighbor, Mr. MacDonald, playing with his children and having a merry time with them. From this incident, she analyzed that all fathers do not have the same behavior. She realized that there are some fathers, like Mr. MacDonald, who are kind and loving, whereas there are some who are rude and harsh, like her own father. However, Kezia's demeanor towards her father transformed soon. One day, suddenly, her mother fell ill and was hospitalized. Her grandmother went along with her mother. So, Kezia was left alone in the house with no one around except the cook, Alice. During the, day ti during the daytime, everything went well, but during nighttime, Kezia found it hard to sleep. She had a dreadful nightmare of a butcher holding a knife and a rope who came close, smiling wretchedly, and she was unable to move from that place. This nightmare woke her up and when she opened her eyes, she noticed that her father was standing right next to her. Soon, Kezia's father took her to his bedroom and made her cozy and comfortable and gave her a place to sleep on his bed. Besides, he also told her that she could rub her feet against his legs for some warmth. Later, she felt very safe and comfortable in her father's company and realized that he wasn't as bad as she had assumed him to be. She could feel the fatherly love that she had felt deprived of all this while and understood that her father loved and cared for her in his own way. Kezia realized that her father was usually cranky every day for the hard work he did to earn a living for his family and was too tired by the evening to come and play with her. After that day, the little girl honored, loved and cared for her father as much as she loved her grandmother and mother. Today we're going over chapter 4 from Beehive, which is a truly beautiful mind. So let's get to it. A Truly Beautiful Mind is a short biography of Albert Einstein, who, as you know, was a genius scientist. He was born on 14th March 1879 in Ulm, a city located in Germany. He couldn't talk until he was two and a half years old. And when he started talking, he would repeat every word twice. His playmates would often refer to him as Brother Boring. His mother thought that he was a freak with an abnormally large head. As a child, Albert Einstein loved playing with mechanical toys. His school headmaster told his father that he had no hopes for young Einstein and considered him to be foolish. When he was six years old, Einstein learned to play the violin on his mother's insistence and became a skilled violinist. While in Munich, Einstein scored good marks in almost every subject in school. By the time he was 15 years old, Einstein started feeling uncomfortable with the school system, so he left it for good. When Einstein's parents moved to Milan, they left him with relatives and he continued his education in Switzerland. Soon after he completed schooling, he took admission at a university in Zurich. 
He felt that the university atmosphere was more liberal in accepting of new concepts and ideas. He was interested in physics and mathematics and wanted to pursue a career in these fields. In 1902, Einstein started working as a technical specialist in the patent office located in Bern, where he would assess other people's inventions and secretly worked on his ideas about the theory of relativity. While at the university, he met Mileva Marek, a fellow student who was equally bright and intelligent. They fell in love and married in January 1903 and had two sons. However, their marriage soon faltered and they finally divorced in 1919, the same year he married Elsa, his cousin. In 1905, Einstein released his paper on special theory of relativity, according to which time and distance were not absolute. This gave birth to the most renowned formula, which describes the relationship between mass and energy, which is E is equal to mc squared. Later in 1915, he published his general theory of relativity, which administered a new description of gravity. In 1919, a solar eclipse proved that his theory of relativity was accurate. In no time, his work was proclaimed by newspapers as a scientific revolution. Einstein was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1921 for his works in physics, which are relevant even today. He was lauded by the press for all the honors that he received for his scientific theory. In 1933, when the Nazis gained control over Germany, Einstein immigrated to the United States of America. He did not want his scientific research to be used for the destruction of mankind, so he moved away from Germany. Further, the discovery of nuclear fission in 1938 led to a huge uproar among American physicists. So Einstein wrote a letter to the American president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, warning him about the hazards of an atomic bomb explosion. However, in 1945, America developed the atomic bomb secretly and threw those bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which caused Albert Einstein acute mental agony. Deeply shaken, Einstein wrote a public memorandum to the United Nations to form a world government that could prevent the recurrence of such massive destruction to mankind. In his last few days, he got involved in politics, thereby advocating democracy and world peace. In 1955, Einstein breathed his last at the age of 76 and is often remembered as a great visionary as much as we remember him as a scientific genius. Welcome to today's session. This is your summary under 10 minutes for Chapter 5 from Beehive, The Snake and the Mirror. Ready to get started? Let's go. Hmm. Has a snake ever coiled itself round any part of your body? A full-blooded cobra? Asked the narrator of the story. The Snake and the Mirror is a story written by Vaikam Muhammad Bashir. The narrator of the story is a homeopathic doctor who talks about his dangerous encounter with a snake while he was resting in his room. He begins the story with how he lived in a small rented room as a bachelor with rats as roommates. He had just set up medical practice and the earnings were meagre or very little. On that night, he had come back after dinner, taken off his black coat, white shirt and not-so-white or dirty vest and hung them up. As he took out a book to read, he was tempted to look at himself in the big mirror kept there. One feels tempted to look into a mirror when it is near one, says the narrator. He also tells us that in those days, he was a great admirer of beauty and believed in making himself look handsome. He justified this by saying he was unmarried and a doctor, so he felt he had to make his presence felt. He heard a noise coming from above the roof, which he ignored, and continued to admire himself in the mirror. He made an important decision. He would shave daily and grow a thin moustache to look more handsome. And emphasized again that after all, he was a bachelor and a doctor. 
Gradually, his chain of thoughts shifted from self-admiration to marrying a bulky woman doctor who would earn plenty of money and had a good medical practice. He wanted to marry a fat woman so that whenever he commits a blunder, she's unable to run after him and catch him. So, he was so lost in his thoughts that he didn't pay heed to the pin drop silence in his room and that the scurrying of the rats was suddenly interrupted. Furthermore, there was a sudden thud like a rubber tube on the ground. He didn't react to the sound at all. But just as he turned around, he saw a snake was wriggling on the back of his chair that landed on his shoulder. In no time, the snake coiled itself on the doctor's left arm around the elbow. The snake was roughly a few inches away from his face. Ugh. Consequently, the doctor was completely numb and remained still like a statue. At that moment, the doctor could feel that God might have punished him for his arrogance. He realized that he was a simple human being and he should not have bragged about his looks. While the doctor was lost in this realization, the snake slowly moved away from him and went closer towards the mirror. As the snake observed itself in its reflection, it was filled with admiration of its own beauty. Seeing this, the doctor silently escaped from his room and ran for his life until he reached a friend's house. The next morning, he returned to his room to find that all of his belongings were robbed except the dirty, not-so-white vest hanging on his room's hanger. As the doctor concluded his tale, the listeners were eager to know about the whereabouts of the snake and asked him several questions pertaining to it. The doctor finally wrapped up his story, stating that he never saw the snake again and assumed probably it was enticed by its own beauty. Today, we will be going over Chapter 6 from Beehive, which is my childhood. So, let's get right to it. Now, my childhood is an extract from Wings of Fire, the autobiography of Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. This chapter sheds light on his childhood and several incidents from his early days. He was born in a middle-class Tamil Muslim family in the island town of Rameshwaram. His family included his parents, three brothers and a sister. His parents were hard-working and kind people who always helped others. Abdul Kalam and siblings spent their childhood in their ancestral home. Kalam's father believed in simple living and provided all the essential necessities to his family. Although his parents had no formal education, they treated others equally and many outsiders would eat with the family regularly. Kalam credits his parents for instilling qualities like self-discipline and honesty in him and his siblings. His family had a secular mindset and they participated in the festivities of Hindus. He also mentioned that he had heard several tales from the Ramayana and the Prophet Muhammad from his mother and grandmother. Now, all of, it, all of this depicts that his family believed in secularism and religion never came in the way of his friendships and studies. Secularism means the belief that religion should not be involved in the organization of society, education, etc. Which is why growing up, Abdul Kalam also had a lot of Hindu, uh, in fact, Brahmin friends. So while growing up in Rameshwaram, friendship played a big role in Kalam's life. Now, as mentioned, he had three close friends, Ramananda Shastri, Arvindan and Shiva Prakashan, who belong to orthodox Hindu Brahmin families. He and his friends never discriminated against each other on the basis of religion or caste. When they grew up, he and his friends took up really different professions. Ramananda Shastri became a priest of the Rameshwaram temple. 
Aravindan undertook the business of transport arrangement for visiting pilgrims and Shiva Prakashan became a contractor for providing catering service in the Southern Railways. Now coming back to Kalam's childhood, one day when he was in the 5th standard, a new teacher came to his class and saw him wearing a cap which marked him as a Muslim. Now when the teacher saw that Kalam being a Muslim was sitting right next to Ramananda, a Hindu priest's son, he couldn't tolerate it. So he asked Kalam to sit in the back bench. Seeing this discrimination, his friend Ramananda started weeping. This incident left a lasting impression in Kalam's mind. Later, they discussed this incident with their respective families and upon hearing about this, Ramananda's father, the head priest of the Rameshwaram temple, immediately summoned the teacher and asked him not to spread communal hatred or social inequality among young minds. He demanded an apology from the teacher for his ill behaviour towards the children. Ramananda's father also said that in case the teacher refused to apologize, he should quit the job right away. In no time, the young teacher apologized and reformed his behavior and started treating everyone equally from then on, irrespective of caste or creed. Kalam also mentioned that his science teacher, Shiva Subramanya Ayer, was an orthodox Hindu Brahmin but treated all his students with equality. On one such occasion, his teacher invited Kalam to his home for a meal. However, Mr. Ayer's wife was a conservative person who refused to serve Kalam or let him sit inside her kitchen to eat the meal. Seeing this, Mr. Ayer wasn't perturbed or angry about his wife's ill behaviour. Instead, he served the meal to young Kalam and sat next to him and ate the food. His wife observed all this from behind the kitchen door. After winding up the meal, his science teacher invited Kalam for dinner again for the following weekend. Now this time, Mr. Ayer's wife served Kalam with her own hands and let him sit inside her kitchen. As Kalam was growing up, the Second World War soon came to an end and the Indian people started their fight for independence. The whole country was filled with an extraordinary sense of optimism to achieve India's independence at all costs. Soon, Kalam asked his father's permission to leave Rameshwaram and study at Ramanantapuram to pursue higher studies. His mother was hesitant about sending him away, but his father stated that children come in this world and receive the love of their parents and near and dear ones. However, this love didn't indicate that they can force their thoughts and decisions on their children. And the rest? is history. APJ Abdul Kalam grew up to be an aerospace scientist and statesman who served as the 11th president of India. That brings us to the end of the summary. Hope you enjoyed it. Today we will be covering chapter 8 from Beehive which is Reach for the Top. So, now in the chapter Reach for the Top we learn from two inspiring women that dedication and hard work always pays off. So part one of Reach for the Top starts with Santosh Yadav, the first woman in the world who has scaled the mighty Mount Everest twice. She was born in a small village in Joniawas located in Rewadi district in Haryana. She was the sixth child of her family with five elder brothers. Although her parents were wealthy landlords, they were not so inclined to provide quality education to their children in good schools. Rather, they chose the local village school for their children's education. Now, despite growing up in a controlled environment, Santosh chose to defy or go against societal norms and carved a path for herself. From a very young age, she was discriminated against on the basis of gender, which tends to happen a lot in our country still. But she decided to fight the system in her own way. When Santosh was 16 years old, her parents wanted her to get married. 
but she decided that she does not want to get married. She told her parents that she wanted to study further and wished to carve a place for herself in the society. She told them that if they objected, she would fund her own education by working part-time jobs. All of this at the age of 16. Finally, they agreed to fund her education. Soon after that, she took admission at a school in Delhi and passed the high school examinations. Then she joined the Maharani College in Jaipur and booked a room in the Kasturba Hotel. Since then, her life took a new turn when she enrolled in a course at Uttarkashi's Nehru Institute of Mountaineering and participated in an expedition. After that, every year she continued participating in an expedition to pursue her new dream of mountaineering. Her hard work finally paid off in 1992 when she climbed the mighty Mount Everest when she was barely 20 years old. She became the youngest woman to achieve such a feat and also saved a fellow mountaineer when she shared her oxygen with him. She secured a unique place for India and herself by creating history in mountaineering and scaling Mount Everest twice in her lifetime. Santosh was awarded one of the highest civilian honours, the Padma Shri by the Indian government for achieving this marvellous feat. That was part one. Let us now move on to part two. Part two of the chapter is about the renowned Russian tennis player Maria Sharapova. This story illustrates her journey of becoming the world champion in women's tennis. She achieved the number one position through hard work, extensive and rigorous training and several sacrifices that she had to make in her life. Now, Maria tells us how she started her tennis training at an early age to reach the summit or the top of women's tennis when she was barely 18 years old. Maria was born in Siberia in Russia and left her hometown at the age of nine to pursue her dream of becoming a tennis star. She had to stay away from her mother and move to Florida along with her father to continue her training. Her father worked hard to fund her tennis training in the United States of America. Now, although she suffered bullying on account of being a foreigner, she never lost hope or gave in to petty remarks. Her will and determination led her to achieve success. Apart from playing tennis, her hobbies are fashion, singing and dancing. Although she says that money is a motivating factor for playing tennis, her sole aim remains to become and continue being number one in the world of tennis. Now, these are two very inspirational women that we just learnt about and that brings us to the end of our summary. Today, we are going to be covering Kathmandu from Beehive. So, what are we waiting for? Let's get right to it. Now, the story Kathmandu is an excerpt or a small part taken from Vikram Seth's novel Heaven Lake that describes a long journey from China to India via Tibet and Nepal. Now, this story provides an insight about his trip to Kathmandu and how he feels about visiting the city. During his stay, he visits two temples in the city which are sacred to Hindus and Buddhists. So the first temple is a pilgrimage of Hindus, the Pashupatinath temple, which allows entry to Hindu devotees only. Now the author notices a lot of chaos in the temple premises as it's filled with tourists, priests, hawkers, animals and of course pilgrims. Besides this, he observes the holy river Bagmati is also being polluted by the people who bathe in it, wash their clothes and also dump used flowers into it. Soon after this, he visits the sacred shrine of the Buddhists, the Bodhnath Stupa temple, which has a huge white tomb that has a sense of serenity and calmness about it. 
outside the temple premises there are small shops which are mostly owned by tibetan immigrants the shopkeepers sell felt bags tibetan print clothes and silver ornaments there now the author finds this place a safe haven with quiet surroundings so a haven is just a safe place so he finds it a safe place peaceful place with quiet surroundings apart from this the author notices that kathmandu has a vivid and religious culture that is filled with small shrines of deities which are decorated with flowers that attract several tourists moreover the city is filled with several antique shops hawkers selling postcards fruit sellers shops that sell western cosmetics chocolates and a lot more now the city is noisy as well as film songs are played loudly in radios car sounds and you know roadside vendors etc so just a lot of chaos around the author buys a marzipan bar a uh, corn on the cob that is glazed with you know the spicy masala and drinks some cold drink to digest all this food he also buys a few books such as love story comics and readers digest soon after his adventurous trip in kathmandu he plans to return to delhi via bus and train journey to patna Thereafter he would opt for a boat ride by crossing Banaras to Allahabad and then go past Agra and then finally get to Delhi but then he realizes that all of this would be too tiring for him and he is feeling really really homesick and just wants to get back home as soon as possible so instead of all these elaborate plans he books a Nepal Airlines return ticket to Delhi meanwhile he observes a flute seller near his hotel who has a pole with several flutes attached to it the flute seller continues playing his flute melodiously in different tunes now this reminds the author about how the flute seller is different from flute players of other cultures and that all cultures have flutes in them and how he is just generally very attracted to the sound of flutes so and this particular flute seller that he sees he doesn't scream like the other hawkers to attract customers rather he plays the instrument thoughtfully now this really attracts the author's attention and he's amazed to learn that you know the flute is such a popular instrument everywhere he then compares the flute tune to a human voice and realizes how he has started noticing and paying attention to many minute details now and that is what generally happens if you spend a lot of time away from home you start appreciating the small things that you perhaps didn't and since he was coming back to his country after such a long time he started paying more attention to smaller details that perhaps he didn't before this that brings us to the end of the summary again this is an excerpt from a larger book and it's so it's a small part of it so it, since you always keep asking me what to read what to read you can always pick up books that um your textbook features excerpts of so if you want a good book to read and if you enjoyed this go ahead and pick up the larger book and give it a read today we will be covering chapter 11 from beehive which is if i were you So let's get started. If I were you is a play written by Douglas James. Now it begins with the phone conversation of a dramatist or a person who writes plays, Gerard, who was preparing to leave his house in order to attend a rehearsal. After hanging up the phone call, he starts packing his travel bag. So while he's engaged in doing all of this work, he suddenly notices this intruder who breaks into his house silently now gerard notices that the unknown man resembles him quite a bit and is holding a revolver in his hand this intruder without wasting any time asks gerard to raise his hands up in the air gerard on the other hand is surprisingly relaxed in the situation and does not panic even though he's at gunpoint He starts chatting with this intruder and asks his name in a very pleasant manner. 
the intruder starts interrogating Gerard about his details. So Gerard requests for them to talk in a comfortable position instead. So the intruder asks him to sit down on a chair. As they start talking again, the intruder asks Gerard if he stays alone and owns a car. To this, Gerard replies that he often travels due to the nature of his work. One of his bags is always kept packed as there are days when he needs to travel out for some urgent work. Besides, Gerard also tells the intruder that he often talks on the telephone without meeting his tradesmen or the people that he works with in person. Meanwhile, Gerard also inquires about the intruder's whereabouts and the latter tells him that he is a criminal who mainly robs jewellery. Further, he also killed a policeman and he wishes to take Gerard's identity by killing him so that he can keep himself from being arrested. Hearing this, Gerard realises that the intruder is not as smart as he had assumed him to be. So he decides to manipulate the intruder and tells him a lie that the intruder eventually believes. So Gerard quickly makes up a story and states that he has a mysterious life of his own. He convinces the intruder that the police is also after him for a murder. And so if the intruder kills him and takes his identity, the police would anyway catch him thinking that he is Gerard. So the intruder believes Gerard's story. When uh, the telephone bell rings, Gerard asks the intruder to go to the garage and flee from the house through the route because uh, Gerard tells the intruder that whenever when he gets a call, that's an indication that the police ha is on the lookout for him. So when Gerard opens the garage door, he pushes the intruder inside and it turns out that the garage door actually led to a cupboard. Gerard locks up the intruder inside. Soon after, he informs the police about the criminal's whereabouts and hands him over to them. So we see that through presence of mind and quick thinking, alertness, Gerard was saved from a life-threatening situation. That brings us to the end of this summary. And at the end of the story, Gerard also thinks this would make a very interesting plot for a play since he is a dramatist.